All right, hello and welcome everyone to the Abbey Museum's virtual programming highlighting Wabanaki arts. These virtual uh, sessions are meant to highlight the ongoing work of artists from across uh, Wabanaki territory and center artists voice for larger audiences. Uh, we have our next program that's actually scheduled on September 14th with coil worker uh, Tara Francis, and we hope that you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, please visit abbeymuseum.org for more information and please follow us on all of our social medias to get the latest news. Um, and I just want to thank you all for joining us today because we're really pleased to have a program today with Emma Hashenkal Pearly, who is a Louis Kui art visual artist from Tobit First Nation. Uh, Emma's portfolio is expansive and she works in a variety of mediums, including beadwork, textiles, soft sculpture, and mural paintings. And today's program is entitled Identity, Relationality, and Community. I want to invite all the attendees to use the Q&A box um, that we set aside for your use uh, to ask questions. And at the end of the program, um, we're going to actually be taking your questions and Emma will be responding. So I'll be turning off my camera at this time, Emma, and you're more than welcome to, to take it away and um, start your program. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. I'm going to start sharing my screen. I think I will also turn my video off just so we can see. Can everybody see that? Yes, we're good. All right, so welcome everyone to this featured program, Identity, Relationality, Community, where I'll be sharing my growing portfolio of public Wabanaki art with you this evening. Um, thank you, Star, for introducing me. Uh, I also like to take the opportunity to introduce myself. I feel like it calms my nerves a little bit. So again, my name is Emma Hassensel Pearly. I'm Wilstigwu from Nagutguk or Toba First Nation, New Brunswick, Canada. I am a visual artist first and foremost. Um, I've been drawing since I could hold a crayon in my hand. I completed a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Mount Allison University in 2017. Uh, after graduation, I worked as a recruitment officer for the university and then I stepped into the Indigenous Affairs Coordinator uh, Liaison position. I did that for about a year, both jobs um, separately. And then a year after graduation had passed, I left Sackville, New Brunswick, where I had lived and gone to school to move back home. Um, and at that time, I decided to leave my job because it wasn't in line with the creative life that I intended to have for myself. And so from that point, uh, that summer, I took on an internship position at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery in Fredericton, New Brunswick, where I became the emerging curator for two years. My focus there was on Indigenous art representation in the gallery space, and I curated four exhibitions in my two-year appointment. And then around the same time, um, I started instructing in the Aboriginal Visual Arts Program, now the Wabanaki Visual Arts Program at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design. And so I like to say that I wear several hats, but art is really at the center of each of my interests. I am not, not currently like working a whole bunch right now as I'm pursuing my master's degree in art history um, at Concordia University. And that's in Montreal, uh, but I do everything online. Um, and it's my thesis year this year, so not too heavy on, on the workload. Um, I teach one course at NDCCD currently and after graduation, I will step into the adjunct curator position with the Beaver Brook Art Gallery. Um, during my undergraduate studies, though, I, I assumed that I would eventually go back to school for a master's in fine arts. But then I started teaching and curating art exhibitions, and that kind of altered my path a bit. 
but my public art career started in the summer of 2015. Um, I think this would have been after my first year at university, after the second year, I think the second year. Um, and I was hired as a summer student through Holistic Education Initiative, which is an organization in Tobik that provides educational services to students of various age groups. And they had purchased a campground named Camp Wollastook in a nearby community. Uh, it's about 20 minutes from here in Muniac, New Brunswick. And every summer I painted cabins in the sun. And it was my dream summer job. This is where I fell in love with painting murals. I had never done any work to this scale. I didn't even really enjoy painting at this time. I started to like it more when I had to take formal painting courses for my degree. Um, but what I really love about doing mural work is the feeling of accomplishment on my body at the end of a long day. And I tend to stay really dedicated when I do this kind of work because it can be so labor intensive. And so I will often work 10 to 12 hour work days when I am painting murals. And so this photo here is like a snippet of six of the, oh, sorry, seven of the 13 cabins that I painted at Camp Ballistic. And you can't really see it on this picture, but in the far right corner, um, I painted the craft hall as well. Um, and this is an image from a drone that somebody was flying one day like through the woods and uh, found this campground and posted it online and she was asking people who whose artwork this was and so I was getting tagged in her video which is kind of cool. Uh, these two images here like before and after images all of the cabins that I did are different colors they have a different animal on the front they're embellished with um, floral designs, uh, double curve designs, um, and just like freehand curve on the sides. And my dream was for the campground to become like this uh, language immersion or language revitalization camp for kids. Um, but they recently sold the campground, I think about a year ago. And so I don't think that will be lived out, unfortunately. But I wanted to make sure that animals were represented, colors were represented, and so they would all be named according to animal and color. And these are some detail shots of the beer cabin and the turtle cabin. Um, this project took me about three summers to complete. Um, and the first summer I completed the majority of the cabins, but they were kind of, they looked kind of different, I think, after my first year. And I decided to change them after the second year. They were color blocked on the sides and it just wasn't working for me. So I decided to do solid colors all around. And then I I threw this in here because I guess we can consider it as public artwork. It hangs in a public space. It is, commissioned by a public building. Um, this work is called Learning Journey and it was done in 2018. This is the last thing that I made before I left Sackville. Um, and it was commissioned by the Harriet Irving Library at the University of New Brunswick. And it's a large painting installed in um, one of their reading rooms that indigenous students tend to occupy. And Um, it was, I was really into like ledger art at this time, though it's not typically a style that belongs to this region. I just remember looking at ledger art a lot and I really, I'm going to go back one, I really didn't know um, or have like a signature style at this point that I was exploring. And so I was just kind of exploring a bunch of different styles at that time, which I guess is typical for an emerging artist. Um, when I look back on this painting, I kind of like, I guess, cringe a little bit. I think that's a normal thing to do too, because for our practices are um, evolving and growing and expanding. And so, yeah, that's not my favorite thing that I've done, but it is in a public space. And so I wanted to be sure that I include it. And I named it Learning Journey because I was reflecting on my journey through education 
in my undergrad and just remembering about how difficult it was at times feeling like uh, the people around me didn't know a lot about who I was, what my history was, where I was coming from, what my experiences had been, what my collective experience, experiences had been. And I have spent the majority of my education trying to unlearn and relearn um, certain parts of history that either were taught to me incorrectly or just weren't taught to me at all. And so I was thinking about students and how they're going to be uh, looking for truths in their academic journeys. Uh, this next work I did as part of the artist in residence program at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. And I had applied for the job before I started working there as an intern. And so there was a bit of an overlap, but they let me work on the residency while I was doing my internship. And this project is titled uh, Blood Memory. Basically, it talks about collective memory that extends beyond 500 years of contact with Europeans and beyond 150 years of Canada's confederation. So it was mainly in response to Canada 150, which had taken place the year before. Um, I guess that it was still kind of looming in, in the air, in the political climate. And so I had measured 150 feet of space on the walking trail behind the gallery, and I strung uh, 50 wooden plywood feathers um, onto cord and kind of disrupted the space in a gentle way that wasn't too obvious or distracting. Um, but I think this work is also about the knowledge that is embedded in our surroundings. I had had a bunch of wooden feathers left over from um, school from a project that didn't end up uh, going through that my grandfather helped me cut. Um, I have about or I had about a little over 2000 done and I remember at the time when when I was making them I wanted to do this dream catcher that was as big as a trampoline and I was going to get the ring of a trampoline and then string all of these feathers onto it uh, as like a performance thing, but also as an installation. And I was going to give it to my school. Uh, so I had big plans for all the feathers when it didn't end up working out. And so I've just been hanging on to them. And sometimes I use them for different things. And I decided to use them in this residency, particularly. And I did this mural, I think the same summer um, when we opened our uh, Head Start building in Tobik, the new Head Start building in Tobik a few years ago. And the instructor uh, basically wanted murals on the wall that she could use as teaching tools. And she teaches the kids the seven sacred teachings. Uh, which come from Anishinaabe territory, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but also, I considered that these are all, these are universal teachings that people and kids should know and learn. And so, I I incorporated double curves into all of the animals. I incorporated double curves flowing onto the wall everywhere, and it was a really fun project, fun little project to do. And then on the other side, I have just the numbers and the colors that kids learn. Uh, a few months after that mural, I did this one at Perth Andover Middle School in um, 2019 during March break. So it took me about a week to do, which I learned quick. It wasn't a lot of time. So I had very, like, very limited experience with painting murals. Um, and I went into it thinking that I had a clear idea when I actually didn't. And then I kind of just created a pattern on the fly. I had been looking at double curves a lot, but I didn't really know how to incorporate them into my work or into my practice. I didn't know how I wanted to use them or talk about them. And so this mural was commissioned by the language 
English teacher at the middle school at the time. And I wanted to do something that was reflective of the work that she was doing with um, kids in middle school. Because here, for a number of years, you would learn the language in the Head Start program. You would learn it on reserve in elementary school. You wouldn't learn it at all in middle school. And then you would only learn it for grade nine and 10 in high school. And so there's a big gap in people's um, like language, less language lessons for kids. And this work is also, it also speaks to the way that language, not the best image, I'm sorry about that. No, um, the way that language is informed by the landscape. And there's a really beautiful teaching that I learned uh, around this idea that realistic way are slow speakers because we moved slowly and softly on the land in the forest when we were hunting, as opposed to uh, maybe Mi'kmaq who inhabit territory near the shore and the sounds of the waves are, are overpowering and so they tend to project their voices a little bit more. And then in the summer of 2009, the city of Fredericton put out a call for uh, public work downtown in a space right next to the Lustig River. Uh, basically, they wanted a mural artist to come and paint this. I don't even really know what this is to this day. It's kind of the end of the walking bridge that goes over a popular um, road and uh, it connects to the walking trail in downtown Fredericton and it's right along the water. It's a really beautiful spot, um, but they call it the bridge to nowhere. I don't really know why. And anyways, I had applied, I got the position. It was the first, I guess, really public art piece that I would do because previously I had done murals inside of schools. Um, and so this one, I would be outside in the public um, all day painting. And it was also the city's first commissioned mural. Um, and so it was, it was my honor to do this work on my home, unceded Wilsigwe territory. And this mural is titled uh, Wichi Wagon, which means with love. And it is my love letter to the Wilsig River. And it is directly inspired by Wabanaki double curves and beadwork. So this is where I start to incorporate uh, incorporate double curves uh, more when I start to think about the, or I, actually when I start to combine my process with beadwork into the way that I paint. And so I will often sketch out double curves onto grid paper to make sure that everything stays symmetrical. And I did the same thing here with this mural, I put everything on a big grid and then I did all of the line work and then I started to block in with color. Uh, the colors are inspired by sunrise and sunset colors because oh, Wabanaki means people of the dawn. Those are colors that I'm typically drawn to as well. Um, so yeah, I approached, I, this is where I started to approach painting like I would beadwork and now I think my beadwork informs my painting and vice versa and you'll see that as we as we go along or if you are familiar with my practice a lot of what I do looks exactly like this uh, this was an in-progress shot before I got all of the lines sorted out and then after this I guess my my um, painting starts to shift a little bit so after the Fredericton mural, my work changed a bit to include forms that were more organic than often calculated beadwork patterns onto grids and squares. Um, so I started to include, it, they look like plant life, but they're usually beadwork forms that mimic plant life coming out of the edges and um, intersecting the more calculated areas. And thinking about the way that beadwork is, is informed by landscape, which is often wild and uncalculated. And so I'm trying to merge those two things together. 
And also I was thinking about some advice from artists, Willis Degoy artist, Percy Sokobi. He had reminded me of the importance of changing the style of double curves or playing with them and adapting them. He says that changing our iconography is important to uh, is important because our cultures are moving and evolving; they're not static. And I think about that all the time. And sometimes I, I come into contact with other people that uh, oppose that approach and feel that these forms should stay traditional because they speak to certain aspects of our life. If we think about the way that certain um, double curves represent have certain meanings or are tied to certain families. Um, but I think that there's a space to exist in both of these perspectives and outlooks. And so this is a mural that I did at Earth Andover Elementary School uh, in the cafeteria. And this work is also inspired by the same beadwork patterns um, and the way they are informed by natural life. So I start to get a little more playful. Uh, this next work I did my last summer at the Beaver Brook, and it's called I Will Always Remember You. And the and Beaver Brook had asked me to do this painting in the window of the um, cafe where a lot of people like to come and sit, but a lot of people like to walk through as well. Um, at the time, um, there had been some uh, tragic deaths of Indigenous peoples in the area, and New Brunswick is a small place, so we often uh, we often know the families and people connected to the families when death occurs, especially in a tragic way. And so I wanted to make this work to honor those people um, and the families that they come from. Um, and the three individuals were Brady Francis, Chantal Moore, and Rodney Levi, and they had all passed. Uh, in the same year, Brady Francis from a hit and run, Chantal Moore from a uh, police officer in Edmonton, and Rodney Levi also from police violence. And so it was really just my way of uh, honoring them, trying to honor them, their lives in a way that felt authentic and it's it's almost hard work to do. And the Beaver Brook wanted to, to, I guess, use it as, some, as a statement of sorts or give me the freedom to express grief in some way. And so they gave me the space to do that. This is my, this next one is my, one of my most recent murals. Um, it was made possible through uh, the Equinox program at Arts NB, and I completed this last summer. Uh, the, the wall is over 100 feet, and it's 13 feet high, um, and it's called It Blooms. And I did this painting on the side of the Tobik Youth Center. Um, and really it's it's like the work is dedicated to youth and my hope that they will always find something that motivates them and their self growth. And then I was looking at it the other day because I play softball to the right. Uh, there's a softball field to the right of this building. Looking at it the other day, thinking about how my work is informed by beadwork primarily and also that beadwork is a community practice that is, um, shared through generations and just thinking about how also how all of how um, double curves represent or can represent one's life journey at the risk of oversimplifying life and death i think that in some way this work also speaks to the similarities in our life journeys everyone everyone's journey looks different but we're all born from the same mother creation and then we go through ups and downs in our lives and then we return to the mother 
And I hope that this perspective offers empathy to other people because our problems, especially in small communities, can feel so big and overbearing, mainly due to trauma and things that we cannot control. And most people I know just try to do their best. And so in that sense, this work is also about community. Speaking to how every aspect of this painting exists on the, on the same plane, if that makes sense. I'm still working through that, that thought. But I was looking at it the other day and my mind just started wandering. After that mural had wrapped up, I did this uh, collaboration with the architects that were working on our new uh, Tilburg Child and Family Services building. And they had asked me to uh, incorporate a drawing for a guardrail that would be made out of metal. And then my designs would be cut out. Um, so we went back and forth about it for a little while. I had given them this. Uh, which is typically how I uh, start my process. I always grab grid paper because I'm working with uh, symmetry so often. And I created this kind of chain link uh, design uh, inspired by the design on the um, Fredericton mural. And it's kind of a, a repetition or this curve specifically with the flower is one that I go back to. So this is the finished product. Um, they had told me at one point that the design would be painted onto metal and then I guess they were able to actually go and cut it out. And so it was really cool to see my design on a material that I had never worked with before. Um, and that's kind of cool to see the different possibilities, things beyond what I can imagine. And this one's just a close-up shot. And the whole thing is repeated around the front of the building. This mural is titled Down by the Bay. Um, and it was commissioned by Friends of Fundy at Fundy National Park in Alma, New Brunswick. I did this last November and it was my first uh, visit to this part of Wolostigwe, Daskaramugari, and Mi'kmaq territory. Though I did not know at the time who had historically, uh, historically occupied space there, and I had to kind of ask around. The Acadians had lived there for so long now, I'd assume that it was Mi'kmaq territory, though it didn't really fall into the seven districts of Mi'kmaq. And so it almost made it difficult to connect with this area, but I had visited um, prior to actually going there and painting. I was really inspired by trees, forests, all of the bright green colors of the moss. Um, they have the highest tides locally in this area. And so I modified double curves to represent that. Their beaches and land mass all have this like beautiful red clay everywhere. And so I was really inspired by just uh, what I saw. And sometimes the murals that I do are catered to the areas that they're going to be in. Um, it's installed somewhere in Funny National Park, but I actually don't know where. I hadn't received an update. Uh, and I also included the sun and the moon on each side, and that represents um, balance. And this is the landscape that it's inspired by. Part of it anyway. Shortly after that, I went and did murals for <clears throat> Maui Incorporated. Uh, this one's in their boardroom. And it's a curve that represents the three communities that they provide services to, the three largest indigenous communities in New Brunswick. Uh, Eskinopidage, Elzebubdik, and Tobik. And then I have the two eagle curves on either side, and that represents protection. Um, and then in the foyer, I have this work. So when you walk in, this is kind of what you see first. Um, and so it's, again, it's that very calculated um, design work based on double curves and then this kind of organic free-flowing mess 
Um, but I think I was also thinking about how it is our hope, it is their hope that communities are you know, healthy and protected and flourishing. And so I was really thinking about the work that they do. I also wanted to provide them with work that was bright and energetic because often the work that they do can be uh, a lot of emotional labor. And so I wanted to give them you know, something bright to look at. Just thinking about the way that art uh, can really change a space and affect somebody's day and affect somebody's mood, affects the way that they feel on a psychological level. Um, this is how I typically will do uh, plan for murals now. I used to go in with just a line drawing, no color, and I would kind of look at the lines on the wall and then I would be able to see color, but I have since bought an iPad and so I'm able to plug in color to see what fits and what doesn't, which makes the process a lot run a lot smoother. Uh, I'm really glad. Um, something too that I would like to mention is that when I often when I do murals, my mom and my sister come to help me. And it's I don't want to uh, overlook how much they they actually help me with all all of this work and I get to spend time with them, which is awesome. Um, and yeah, they're they're so helpful with the whole process. So this is something that's kind of up and coming. It's a sketch of a logo for a children's park in Tobik that will be built um, over the next year. They plan to build a new softball field, splash pad for the kids, um, and a soccer field. And this is the um, logo for the sign that will be at the, the front of the park. So for me, public art is mainly about representing the community that I come from, the nation that I come from. Public art can also be a spiritual and political act in the way that we honor our spirits by taking back and taking up space. And I think I gravitate towards utilizing Wabanaki iconography because I want all of these nations represented to feel represented. Uh, I'm Willis Degway and I belong to a small community and it's easy for me to feel like I'm in a bubble, but it, I also belong to a nation um, and a confederacy comprised of other nations. And so I think that's like a main drive behind utilizing double curves. In my bio, I often talk about my exploration around identity as a Willis Degway woman. Um, it's an ongoing exploration about who I am through looking at material and visual culture. And then once I started relying on double curve iconography to guide this exploration, I learned so much more about, I think about who I am and what I value most, like family and rematriation, community, understanding the ways that my mom and my grandmother play fundamental roles in my life. And I will often, um, rework double curves to represent that relationship. Not to discredit my dad or my grandfather, but I really wanted to unlearn patriarchal ideologies. And I think it's, overall, I think it's a special thing to have my work in public spaces because I get to share that. Uh, I get to share my gift and my worldview and my first language with people that I often know personally who go to school in these places and go to work in these places and visit these places. And when I think about relationality in a communal sense or in a general sense, I think about that we all exist on the same plane as people, animals, insects, water, ancestors. There are really no hierarchies. And in fact, we need to unlearn that kind of thinking. Um, but indigenous public art, is often a reclamation of land that we've been pushed out of often violently, especially for those of us along a first contact zone. And for me, it's not just about that resistance to colonial and state violence, it's also about my personal communal right to beautify a space with my work um, and, the, and represent the symbols of where I come from 
to make that space relative to our context. Because art upholds our histories, it upholds our cultures, our worldviews, languages, um, et cetera. Art uh, is a historical record of the people that we're going to be and that we used to be. And like I said before, art can really change the space. When you go visit the West Coast, for example, and you step off the plane in Vancouver, you know whose territory you're in. Um, and their art is at the forefront of almost every public space and institution. You can't, you can't not see it, basically. And that's the way that it should be. And then here I find we don't, I guess we don't always have that luxury, but that's changing now and that's really exciting for me. So that is my portfolio as it stands. I want to thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I think we're going to go into question time now. Um, but again, thank you for inviting me. Find you star. <laughs> yeah. One second. No problem. Oh, there we go. All right. Um, so we do have a couple questions now. And the first one is um, if there was a specific reason why um, you started thinking on a larger scale and started thinking about um, making that first mural and making those first pieces that were going up in these public spaces. Was there a, a specific inspiration around that? I can think back to when I was a student in my undergrad and my then boss had brought me into a meeting with um, his boss who had purchased that campground and told me, you know, we want to hire you to do this project. And at the time it felt felt like way too big, way too complicated for me to execute because I had never worked on that scale before. But it's all been a learning curve, yes, but I think I learned a lot as I went on. And then I just started thinking like, bigger is better and more is more. And um, I didn't really think too much about my work being in public space or what that would mean until a lot later. I just knew that I had the best summer job ever and I was just gonna paint in the woods all day. And so I think about the way that my work exists in public spaces now for sure. But at the time, um, I just knew that scale was going to be a challenge and it was a challenge that I wanted to step up to. Um, we have another question from the audience and I wanna encourage anybody else who has questions to use the Q&A box um, to ask Emma any questions that you have about her work. Um, this person says, thank you so much for sharing your process and some of your teachings. Uh, do you be dear designs? Sometimes I do. I like to make earrings a lot. I like to make pins. Um, I've never gotten to do large scale beadwork, which is something I, I kind of want to get into as well. Um, haven't been beading a whole lot this past year just because of school. Um, but once in a while, I will bead my, my mural designs. But often the mural designs come from my beadwork directly. Uh, where can we see your art on display? So this person wants to know um, if you're showing anywhere or uh, maybe even some of the, the locations again of, of where your uh, murals are at. Mostly everything is in Western New Brunswick and then a little bit Southern New Brunswick. That one uh, at Fundy National Park, I wish I knew where it was, but I actually don't know where it is. I just know it's in the park somewhere. Um, they weren't really sure where they're going to hang it, but um, most murals that I've done are in Tobik or in Perth where I had gone to school growing up and uh, just the the one downtown Fredericton and then Maui office in Fredericton as well. But everything's in New Brunswick. <laughs> um, somebody in the audience says I love seeing the progression of your work. Um, have you thought about doing collabs with other Wabanaki artists? Yes, I'd love to. <laughs> I don't often get the opportunity 
to do collaborations but every time that I've gotten the chance to it's like it's such a fun process and you learn so much from each other um I'd love to do a collaborative mural if possible with other Wabanaki artists um my friend Natalie Safir or Samagwani Jajak if anybody knows that artist talked about it a few times and almost uh, applied for one but it didn't end up working out for our schedules uh, that's the only thing that keeps me really from doing collabs but I would love to do more Oh, I see. We have a question from another Wabanaki artist, but they were wondering if you are willing to uh, travel for your mur murals. Um, they'd love to see your work in Maine. Yes, yeah. I would love to do murals in Maine. <laughs> if I ever got the opportunity, I would love to travel. Um, I would also, it's a dream of mine to do Vancouver Mural Fest one day. But I think about like festivals like that that I would love to take on. Things where you need like a team and that thing that goes up and down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I would love to travel for, for that. If I could, if I could just paint murals as a day job, mm -hmm. I would, that's probably what I would do. Um, when you start one of your mural projects, um, how do you gather your inspiration and how do you plan out your designs? Um, it often depends on who's commissioning the work, where the work is going to be, who's going to be seeing this work. Um, oftentimes they have an idea of what they want to see, but are also open to my creativity as well, which has been really cool. Um, there's not too many times that I'm like confined to a certain idea. And I think I mostly gather inspiration from I always go back to double curves and I try to alter them in a way that makes sense to the project. Um, like I said, uh, beadwork is something that I look at often. Um, uh, I, like I said, I'm studying art history and a part of that is focusing my interests towards um, material culture, looking at regalia, beaded purses, the history of beaded purses and trade objects and tourism uh, are things I'm really interested in as well. And so my studies are really starting to kind of pull loose ends together, I guess, but it usually depends. Um, some of your other mediums that you work in, um, they, they feel a little bit different than what you do uh, in the murals. And I was wondering if you could uh, discuss some of the similarities that you see with your mural work, but then maybe some of those threads that are a little bit different, some other ideas that you get to explore in your other mediums that aren't necessarily present in your, in your bigger work. Well, when I was doing my undergrad, I was mainly working in like printmaking mediums. Um, I was doing painting and I was drawing a lot. And at the time I was making like political work or my work often had political undertones. It was about people, it was about the Indian Act, it was about um, historical injustices and moments in, in history, significant moments in indigenous history in Canada. But I guess my big focus has mainly been on um, an exploration of the term legislative identity or how the Indian Act has impacted the identities of status Indians in Canada um, on a communal level, on a personal level, and on a national level, and how it opposes traditional governance systems, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I did a flag, standard size Canadian flag, and I ran the Indian Act through a paper shredder for one of my projects, and I bonded all of the shred to the red parts of the Canadian flag. And then the sister piece to that work is called Athamia, and it means she keeps praying. And it's a red jingle dress with uh, shreds of the Indian Act um, on the skirt and then among the jingles. And so when I think about those works and I think about my murals, it's like almost a stark difference. And I don't know at this time how those things are kind of, you know, weaving through other than to say that uh, these two things are, are part of my identity in the way that I want to 
um, express my identity and think about my identity and how um, legislation is imposed on indigenous people's identities, but it's not often our, our barrier to carry. It is, but it isn't. I think about the way that um, our identities have often been politicized and that's where that work comes in. But then it's also like, we're allowed to celebrate the other parts of our identity, the things that we find beautiful. Um, and yeah, I'm kind of just somewhere in between those things. Um, well, that is it for our questions that we have from the audience. I do want to thank you again for, for being with us. And if you'd like to um, sign us off and um, have the, you know, the last moments to address everybody, I, I'd be happy to have you do that. I just want to say a big thank you. Thank you for the questions. I really appreciate them. My public work is uh, still growing and I'm still thinking about all of my ideas and uh, practicing talking about it openly is like this gives me the opportunity to um, practice expressing some of these ideas and the way that I'm thinking about them as they're evolving with me. And so I'm really excited about this little journey in public art um, because I think this is an area that I want to explore more for sure. I'm not satisfied with doing small paintings anymore. They have to be you know, monumental size. <laughs> but again, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and the space to do that.